Chapter 40, Getting People's Attention. So many of my students were incredibly smart. I knew they would get into the working world and create terrific new software programs, animated projects, and entertainment devices. I also knew they had the potential to frustrate millions of people in the process. Those of us who are engineers and computer scientists don't always think about how to build things so that they're easy to use. A lot of us are terrible at explaining complex tasks in a simple way. <laughs> Ever read the instruction booklet for a VCR? Then you've lived the frustration I'm talking about. That's why I wanted to impress upon my, stu my students the importance of thinking about the end users of their creations. How could I make clear to them how important it was not to create technology that is frustrating? I came up with a surefire attention getter. When I taught a user interface class at the University of Virginia, I'd bring in a working VCR on the very first day. I would put it on a desk in the front of the room. I would pull out a sledgehammer. I would destroy the VCR. Then I would say, when we make something hard to use, people get upset. They become so angry that they want to destroy it. We don't want to create things that people will want to destroy. The students would look at me and I could tell they were shocked, bewildered, and slightly amused. It was exciting for them. They were thinking, I don't know who this guy is, but I'm definitely coming to class tomorrow to check out his next stunt. I sure got their attention. That's always the first step to solving an ignored problem. When I left the University of Virginia for Carnegie Mellon, my friend and fellow professor Gabe Robbins gave me a sledgehammer with a plaque attached. It read, <laughs> so many VCRs and so little time. All of the students from my days at the University of Virginia are in the workforce now, and they go about creating new technologies. I hope once in a while I will come into their minds, swinging that sledgehammer, reminding them of the frustrated masses yearning for simplicity. Chapter 41, The Lost Art of Thank You Notes. Showing gratitude is one of the simplest yet most powerful things humans can do for each other. And despite my love of efficacy, I think that thank you notes are the best done the old fashioned way with pen and paper. Job interviewers and admission officers see lots of applicants. They read tons of resumes from A students with many accomplishments, but they do not see many handwritten thank you notes. If you are a B plus student, your handwritten thank you note will raise you at least half a grade in the eyes of a future boss or admis admissions officer. You will become an A to them. And because handwritten notes have gotten so rare, they will remember you. When I'd give this advice to my students, it was not to make them into calculating schemers, although I know some embraced it in those terms. My advice was more about helping them recognize that there are respectful, considerate things that can be done in life that will be appreciated by the recipient and that will only end up as a good result. For instance, there was a young lady who applied to get into the ETC and we were about to turn her down. She had big dreams. She wanted to be a Disney Imagineer. Her grades, her exams, her portfolio were good, but not quite good enough, given how selective the ETC could afford to be. But before we put her into the no pile, I decided to page through her file one more time. As I did, I noticed a handwritten thank you note that had been slipped between the other pages. The note hadn't been sent to me or my co-director, Don Martinelli, or any other faculty member. Instead, she had mailed it in a non-faculty support staffer who had helped her with the arrangements when she came to visit. This staff member held no sway over her application, so this was not a suck-up note. 
It was just a few words of thanks to somebody who, unbeknownst to her, happened to toss her note to him into her application folder. And then weeks later, I came upon it. Having unexpectedly caught her thanking someone just because it was the nice thing to do, I paused to reflect on this. She had written her note by hand. I like that. This tells me more than anything else in her file, I said to Dawn. I read through her materials again. I thought about her. Impressed by her note, I decided she was worth taking a chance on, and Dawn agreed. She came to the ETC, got her master's degree, and is now a Disney Imagineer. I told her this story, and now she tells it to others. Despite all that is going on now in my life and with my medical care, I still try to write handwritten notes when it's important to do so. It's just a nice thing to do, and you never know what magic might happen after it arrives in someone's mailbox. Chapter 42. Loyalty is a two-way street. When Dennis Cosgrove was an undergraduate student of mine at the University of Virginia in the early 1990s, I found him to be impressive. He was doing terrific work in my computer lab. He was a teaching assistant in the operating systems course. He was taking graduate level courses and he was an A student. Well, in most classes, he was an A student. In Calculus 3, he was an F student. It wasn't that he lacked the ability. He was just so focused on his computer courses, being a teaching assistant and a research assistant in my lab, that he simply stopped going to his calculus class. That turned out to be a serious problem, as it was not the first time he had a semester in which he had earned straight A's with an F. It was two weeks into the new semester when Dennis's checkered academic re record caught the attention of a certain dean. He knew how smart Dennis was. He'd seen his SAT and AP scores. In his view, the Fs were all due to attitude, not aptitude. And he wanted to just expel Dennis. But I knew Dennis had never received a single warning about any of this. In fact, all of his A's offset the Fs to the point where he couldn't even be academically suspended. Yet the dean invoked an obscure rule that left expulsion on the table. I decided to go to bat for my student. Look, I told the dean, Dennis is a strong rocket with no fins. He has been a star in my lab. If we kick him out right now, we will be missing the whole point of what we're here for. We're here to teach, to nurture, I know Dennis is going somewhere special. We can't just dump him. The Dean was not happy with me. In his view, I was a young professor getting pushy. Then I got even pushier. I went technical. The new semester had already begun. The university had cashed Dennis's tuition check. By doing so, as I saw it, we were telling him he was welcome to remain as a student. Had we expelled him before the semester, we could have tried to enroll, he could have tried to enroll in another school. Now it's too late for that. I asked the Dean, what if he hires a lawyer to argue this? I might just testify on his behalf. Do you want one of your faculty members testifying against the university? The Dean was taken aback. You're a junior faculty member, he said. You're not even tenured yet. Why are you sticking your neck out and making this a battle you want to undertake? I'll tell you the reason, I said. I want to vouch for Dennis because I believe in him. The dean took a long look at me. I'm going to remember this when your tenure case comes up, he said. In other words, if Dennis screwed up again, my judgment would be seriously questioned. That's a deal, I told the dean, and Dennis was able to stay in school. He passed Calculus three, did us all proud, and after graduation went on to become an award-winning star in computer science. He has been part of my life and my labs ever since. In fact, he was one of the early fathers of the ALICE project. 
As a designer, he did groundbreaking programming work to help make the virtual reality system more accessible to young people. I went to bat for Dennis when he was 21 years old. Now at age 37, he's going to bat for me. I've entrusted him with carrying Alice into the future as a research scientist designing and implementing my professional legacy. I enabled Dennis's dream way back when he needed it. And now that I need it, he's enabling mine. Chapter 43. The Friday Night Solution. I got tenure a year earlier than people usually do. That seemed to impress other junior faculty members. Wow, you got tenure early, they'd say to me. What was your secret? I said, it's pretty simple. Call me any Friday night in my office at 10 o'clock and I'll tell you. Of course, this was before I had a family. A lot of people want a shortcut. I find the best shortcut is the long way, which is basically two words, work hard. As I see it, if you work more hours than somebody else during those hours, you learn more about your craft that can make you more efficient, more able, and even happier. Hard work is like compounded interest in the bank. The rewards build faster. The same is true in your life outside of your job. All my adult life, I've felt drawn to ask long married couples how they were able to stay together. All of them said the same thing. We worked hard at it. Chapter 44, Show Gratitude. Not long after I got tenure at the University of Virginia, I took my entire 15 person research team down to Disney World for a week as my way of saying thank you. A fellow professor took me aside and said, Randy, how could you do that? Perhaps he thought I was setting a precedent that other soon to be tenured professors would be unwilling to equal. How could I do that? I answered. These people just worked their butts off and got me the best job in the world for life. How could I not do that? So the 16 of us headed down to Florida in a large van we had a complete blast, and I made sure we all got an education with our entertainment, too. Along the way, we stopped at various universities and visited computer research groups. The Disney trip was gratitude easily delivered. It was a tangible gift, and it was a perfect way because it was an experience I could share with people I cared about. Not everyone is so easily thanked, however. One of my greatest mentors was Andy Van Dam, my computer science professor when I was at Brown. He gave me wise counsel. He changed my life. I could never adequately pay him back, so I just have to pay it forward. I always like telling my students, go out and do for others what somebody did for you. Riding down to Disney World, talking to my students about their dreams and goals, I was trying to do my best to do just that. Chapter 45, send out thin mints. As part of my responsibilities, I used to be an academic reviewer. That meant I'd have to ask other professors to read densely written research papers and review them. It could be tedious, sleep inducing work. So I came up with an idea. I send a box of Girl Scout Thin Mints with every paper that needed to be reviewed. Thank you for agreeing to do this, I'd write. The enclosed Thin Mints are your reward, but no fair eating them until you review the paper. That put a smile on people's faces and I never had to call or nag them. They had the box of Thin Mints on their desk. They knew what they had to do. Sure, sometimes I had to send a reminder email, but when I pinged people, all I needed was one sentence. Do you eat those Thin Mints yet? I have found Thin Mints are a great communication tool. They're also a sweet reward for a job well done. Chapter 46, all you have is what you bring with you. I've always felt a need to be prepared for whatever situation I've found myself in. When I leave the house, what do I need to bring? When I teach a class, 
What questions should I anticipate? When I'm preparing for my family's future without me, what documents should I have in place? My mother recalls taking me to a grocery store when I was seven years old. She and I got up to the checkout counter and she realized she'd forgotten a couple items on her shopping list. She left me with a cart and she ran off to get what she needed. I'll be right back, she said. She was gone just a few minutes, but in that time, I had loaded all the items on the belt and everything was rung up. I was left staring at the cashier who was staring at me. The cashier decided to make a sport of the situation. Do you have money for me, son? She said, I'll need to be paid. I didn't realize she was just trying to amuse herself. So I stood there mortified and embarrassed. By the time my mom returned, I was angry. You left me here with no money. This lady asked me for the money and I have nothing to give her. Now that I'm an adult, you'll never catch me with less than $200 in my wallet. I want to be prepared in case I need it. Sure, I could lose my wallet or it could be stolen, but for a guy making a reasonable living, $200 is an amount worth risking. By contrast, not having cash on hand when you need it is potentially a much bigger problem. I've always admired people who are over prepared. In college, I had a classmate named Norman Marowitz. One day he was giving a presentation on an overhead projector in the middle of his talk, the light bulb on the projector blew out. There was an audible groan from the audience. I'll have to wait 10 minutes until someone found a new projector. It's okay, Norm announced. There's nothing to worry about. We watched him walk over to his knapsack and pull out something. He had brought along a spare bulb for the overhead projector. <laughs> Who even thinks of this? <laughs> Our professor, Andy Van Dam, happened to be sitting next to me. He leaned over and said, that guy's going places. And he was right. Norm became a top executive at Macromedia Incorporated, where his efforts have affected almost everyone who uses the internet today. Another way to be prepared is to think negatively. Yes, I am a great optimist, but when trying to make a decision, I often think about the worst case scenario. I call it the eaten by wolves factor. If I do something, what's the most terrible thing that could happen? Would I be eaten by wolves? One thing that makes it possible to be an optimist is if you have a contingency plan for when all hell breaks loose. There are lots of things I don't worry about because I have a plan in place if they do. I've often told my students, when you go into the wilderness, the only thing you can count on is what you take with you. And essentially, the wilderness is anywhere but your home or office. So take money, bring your repair kit, imagine the wolves, pack a light bulb, be prepared. Chapter 47, a bad apology is worse than no apology. Apologies are not pass fail. I've always told my students when giving an apology, any performance lower than an A really doesn't cut it. Half-hearted or insincere apologies are often worse than not apologizing at all because recipients find them insulting. If you've done something wrong in your dealings with another person, it's as if there's an infection in your relationship. A good apology is like an antibiotic. A, a bad apology is like rubbing salt in the wound. Working in groups is crucial in my classes and friction between students is unavoidable. Some students wouldn't pull their load. Others are so full of themselves that they belittle their partners. By mid-semester, apologies were always in order. And when students wouldn't do it, everything would spin out of control. So I'd often give classes my little routine about apologies. I'd start by describing the two classic bad apologies. Number one, I'm sorry you feel hurt by what I've done. This is an attempt at an emotional salve, but it's obvious you, obvious you don't want to put any medicine in the wound. And number two, I apologize for what I did, but you also need to apologize to me for what you've done. 
That's not giving an apology, that's asking for one. Proper apologies have three parts. Number one, what I did was wrong. Number two, I feel badly that I hurt you. Number three, how do I make this better? Yes, some people may take advantage of you when answering question number three, but most people will be genuinely appreciative of your make good efforts. They may tell you how to make it better in some small, easy way, and often they will work harder to make things better themselves. Students would say to me, what if I apologize and the other person doesn't apologize back? I tell them, that's not something you can control, so don't let it eat at you. If other people owe you an apology and your words of apology to them are proper and heartfelt, you still may not hear from them for a while. After all, what are the odds that they get into the right emotional place to apologize at the exact same moment you do? So just be patient. Many times in my career, I saw students apologize and then several days later, their classmates came around. Your patience will be both appreciated and rewarded. Chapter 48, Tell the Truth. If I could only give three words of advice, they would be, tell the truth. If I've got three more words, I'd add, all the time. My parents taught me that you're only as good as your word, and there is no better way to say it. Honesty is not only morally right, it's also efficient. In a culture where everyone tells the truth, you can save a lot of time double-checking. When I taught at the University of Virginia, I loved the honor code. If a student was sick and needed a makeup exam, I didn't need to create a new one. The student just pledged that he hadn't talked to anybody about the exam, and I would give him the old test. People lie for lots of reasons, often because it seems like a way to get what they want with less effort. But like many short-term strategies, it's ineffective long-term. You run into people again later and they remind you, you lied to them. And they tell lots of other people about it. That's what amazes me about lying. Most people who have told a lie think they got away with it, when in fact, they didn't. Chapter 49, get in touch with your crayon box. People who know me sometimes complain that I see things in black or white. In fact, one of my colleagues would tell people, go to Randy if you want black and white advice, but if you want gray advice, he's not the guy. Okay, I stand guilty as charged, especially when I was younger. I used to say my crayon box had only two colors in it, black and white. I guess that's why I love computer science, because most everything is true or false. As I've gotten older though, I've learned to appreciate that a good crayon box might have more than two colors, but I still think that if you run your life the right way, you'll wear out the black and white before the more nuanced colors. In any case, whatever the color, I love crayons. At my last lecture, I brought along several hundred of them. I wanted everyone to get one when they walked into the lecture hall, but in the confusion, I forgot to have the folks at the door pass them out. Too bad. My plan was this. As I spoke about childhood dreams, I'd ask everyone to close their eyes and rub their crayons in their fingers to feel the texture, the paper, the wax. Then I'd have them bring their crayons up to their noses and take a good long sniff. Smelling a crayon takes you right back to childhood, doesn't it? I once saw a colleague do a similar crayon routine with a group of people and it had inspired me. In fact, since then, I've often carried a crayon in my shirt pocket. When I need to go back in time, I put it under my nose and take another hit. I'm partial to the black crayon and the white crayon, but that's just me. Any color has the same potency. Breathe it in, you'll see. The $100,000 Salt and Pepper Shaker, Chapter 50. When I was 12 years old and my sister was 14, our family went to Disney World in Orlando. Our parents figured we were just old enough to roam a bit around the park without being monitored. In those days, before cell phones, mom and dad told us to be careful 
picked a spot where we could meet 90 minutes later, and then they let us take off. Think of the thrill that was. We were in the coolest place imaginable, and we had the freedom to explore it on our own. We were also extremely grateful to our parents for taking us there and for recognizing we were mature enough to be by ourselves. So we decided to thank them by pooling our allowances and getting them a present. We went into a store and found what we considered the perfect gift, a ceramic salt and pepper shaker featuring two bears hanging off a tree, each one holding a shaker. We paid $10 for the gift, headed out of the store, and skipped up Main Street in search of the next attraction. I was holding the gift and in a horrible instant, it slipped out of my hands. The thing broke on impact. My sister and I were both in tears. An adult guest at the park saw what happened and came over to us. Take it back to the store, she, she suggested. I'm sure they will give you a new one. I can't do that, I said. It was my fault, I dropped it. Why would the store give us another one? Try anyway, the adult said, you never know. So we went back to the store and we did not lie. We explained what happened. The employees in the store listened to our story and smiled at us. They told us we could have a new salt and pepper shaker. They even said it was their fault because they hadn't wrapped the original salt and pepper shaker well enough. Their message was, our packaging should have been able to withstand a fall due to a 12 year old's over excitement. I was in shock. Not just gratitude, but disbelief. My sister and I left the store completely giddy. When my parents learned of the incident, it really increased their appreciation of Disney World. In fact, that one customer service decision over a $10 salt and pepper shaker would end up earning Disney more than $100,000. Let me explain. Years later, as a Disney Imagineering consultant, I would sometimes end up chatting with executives pretty high up the Disney chain of command. And whenever I could, I would tell them the story of the salt and pepper shaker. I would explain how the people in that gift shop made my sister and I feel very good about Disney and how that led my parents to appreciate the institution on a whole other level. My parents made visits to Disney World an integral part of their volunteer work. They had a 22 passenger bus and they used it to drive English as a second language students from Maryland down to see the park. For more than 20 years, my dad bought tickets for dozens of kids to go to Disney World. I went on most of those trips. All in all, since that day, my family has spent more than 100,000 at Disney World on tickets, food, souvenirs for ourselves and others. When I tell this story to today's Disney's executives, I always end it by asking them, if I sent a child into one of your stores with a broken salt and pepper shaker today, would your policies allow your workers to be kind enough to replace it? The executives squirm at that question. They know the answer, probably not. Because Nowhere in their accounting system are they able to measure how a $10 salt and pepper shaker might yield 100000 And so it's easy to envision that a child today would be out of luck, sent out of the store with empty hands. My message is this. There is more than one way to measure profit and loss. On every level, institutions can and should have a heart. My mom still has that $100,000 salt and pepper shaker. The day the folks at Disney World replaced it, it was a great day for us and not a bad one for Disney. Chapter 51, no job is beneath you. It's been well documented that there's a growing sense of entitlement among young people today. I've certainly seen it in my classrooms. There are so many graduating seniors that have this notion that they should be hired just because of their creative brilliance. Too many are unhappy with the idea of starting at the bottom. My advice has always been, you ought to be thrilled you got a job in the mailroom. And when you get there, here's what you do. Be really great at sorting mail. No one wants to hear someone say, I'm not good at sorting mail because the job is beneath me. No job should be beneath us. 
and if you can't or won't sort mail, where's the proof that you can do anything? After our ETC students were hired by companies for internships or first jobs, we'd often ask the firms to give us feedback on how they were doing. Their bosses almost never had anything negative to say about their abilities or their technical chops. But when we did get negative feedback, it was almost always about how the new employees were too big for their britches or that they were already eyeing the corner office. When I was 15, I worked in an orchard hoeing strawberries and most of my coworkers were day laborers. A couple of teachers worked there too, earning a little extra cash for the summer. I made a comment to my dad about the job being beneath those teachers. I guess I was implying that the job was beneath me too. My dad gave me a tongue lashing of a lifetime he believed manual labor was beneath no one. He said he'd prefer that I worked hard and become the best ditch digger in the world rather than coasting along as a self-impressed elitist behind a desk. I went back into that strawberry field and I still didn't like the job, but I'd heard my dad's words. I watched my attitude and I hoed a little harder. Know where you are, chapter 52. Okay, Professor Boy, what can you do for us? That was the greeting I received from M.K. Haley, a 27-year-old Imagineer who was given the job of babysitting me during my sabbatical at Disney. I had arrived in a place where my academic credentials mean nothing. I became a traveler in a foreign land who had to find a way to come up with a local currency fast. For years, I told my students about this experience because it's a crucial lesson. Although I had achieved my childhood dream of being an Imagineer, I had gone from being the top dog in my academic research lab to an odd duck in the rough and tumble pond. I had to figure out how my wonky ways could fit into this make or break creative culture. I worked on the Aladdin virtual reality attraction, then being tested at Epcot. I joined Imagineers interviewing guests about how they liked the ride. Did they get dizzy, disorientated, nauseated? Some of my new colleagues complained that I was applying ap academic values that wouldn't work in the real world. They said I was too focused on poring over data, too insistent on approaching things scientifically rather than emotionally. It's a hardcore academia, academia me versus the hardcore entertainment them. Finally, though, after I figured out a way to save 20 seconds per guest by loading the ride differently, I gained some street cred with those Imagineers who had their doubts about me. The reason I tell this story is to emphasize how sensitive you need to be when crossing from one culture to another, in my students' cases, from school to their first job. As it turned out, at the end of my sabbatical, Imagineering offered me a full-time job. After much agonizing, I turned it down. The call of teaching is just too strong. But because I'd figure out how to navigate both in academia and the entertainment industry, Disney found a way to keep me involved. I became a once a week consultant to Imagineering, which I did happily for 10 years. If you can find your footing between two cultures, sometimes you can have the best of both worlds. Chapter 53. Never give up. When I was a senior in high school, I applied to Brown University and didn't get in. I was on the wait list. I called the admissions office until they eventually decided that they might as well accept me. They saw how badly I wanted in. Tenacity got me over the brick wall. When it was time to graduate from Brown, it never occurred to me in a million years to go to graduate school. People in my family got an education and then they got jobs. They didn't keep getting an education. But Andy Van Dam, my Dutch uncle and mentor at Brown, advised me, get yourself a PhD, be a professor. Why should I do that? I asked him. And he said, because you're such a good salesman and if you go to work for a company, they're gonna use you as a salesman. If you're going to be a salesman, you may as well be selling something worthwhile, like education. I am forever grateful for that advice. Andy told me to apply to Carnegie Mellon, 
where he had sent a long string of his best students. You'll get in, no problem, he said. He wrote me a letter of recommendation. The Carnegie Mellon faculty read his glowing letter. They saw my reasonable grades and my lackluster graduate exam scores. They reviewed my application and they rejected me. I was accepted into other PhD programs, but Carnegie Mellon didn't want me. So I sent, I went to Andy's office and dropped the rejection letter on his desk. I want you to know how much Carnegie Mellon values your recommendations, I said. Within seconds of letter hitting his desk, he picked up the phone. I'll fix this. I'll get you in, he said, but I stopped him. I don't want to do it that way, I told him. So we made a deal. I would check out the schools that had accepted me. If I didn't feel comfortable at any of them, I'd come back to him and we'd talk. The other schools ended up being such a bad fit that I soon find myself returning to Andy. I told him, I've decided to skip graduate school and get a job. No, 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 he said, you've got to get your PhD. We've got to get you into Carnegie Mellon. He picked up the phone and called Nico Haberman, the head of Carnegie Mellon's computer science department, who also happened to be Dutch. They, they talked about me in Dutch for a while, and then Andy hung up and told me, be in his office at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Nico was a presence an old school European style academic. It was clear at our meet meeting, it was only happening as a favor to his friend, Andy. He asked me why he should be reconsidering my application, given that the department had already evaluated me. Speaking carefully, I said, since the time that I was reviewed, I want a full fellowship from the Office of Naval Research. Nico replied gravely, Having money isn't part of our admissions criteria. We fund our students out of research grants. And then he stared at me more precisely. He stared through me. There are a few key moments in anyone's life. A person is fortunate if he can tell in hindsight when they have happened. I knew in that moment that I was in one. With all the deference of my young, arrogant self that I could muster, I said, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to imply that it was about the money. It's just that they only offered 15 of these fellowships nationwide. So I thought it was an honor that would be relevant and I apologize if it was presumptuous of me. It was the only answer I had, but it was the truth. Very, very slowly. Nico's frozen vicious thawed and we talked for a few minutes more. After meeting with several other faculty, I ended up being accepted by Carnegie Mellon and I got my PhD. It was a brick wall surmounted with a huge boost from a mentor and some sincere groveling. Until I got on stage at my last lecture, I had never told students or colle colleagues at Carnegie Mellon that I had been rejected when I applied there. What was I afraid of? That they'd all think I wasn't smart enough to be in their company? That they'd take me less seriously? It's interesting. The secrets you decide to reveal at the end of your life? I should have been telling that story for years because the moral is if you want something bad enough, never give up and take the boost when it's offered. Brick walls are there for a reason. And once you get over them, even if someone has practically had to throw you over it, it can be helpful to others to tell them how you did it.